A lot of attention has been paid to our aces getting hurt and justifiably so. But what about our guys that are getting bombed too? What about them? They're people too. We're going to talk about that with Paul Spore coming up on the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Jeff Erickson here with Fangrass very own Paul Spore. As always, we are brought to you by Vivid Seats and On Demand DFS. Thank you for your sponsorship, guys. Uh, Paul, I'm so glad you could join us today. Uh, you you uh, write a daily pitching column. You have to send a, rank the player, pitchers for the starting pitchers for every day on Fangrass. You are the pitching guru in our industry. You have a podcast now with Nick Pollock from Pitcher List. You've always been a guy that's been on top of that. We have a lot of good pitchers having bad outings so far to start the season. It's been rough. Thank you so much for having me on, Jeff. I love talking with you. love participating in some of your other pods. The Sunday Night Pod is a can't miss for me with you and Scott. So I appreciate being with you. But yeah, it is tough. And it's a really tough time of the year. And, you know, I... I have started taking to kind of doing a little bit of extra commentary on the SP chart at the beginning of it now. Mm -hmm. And the, and the first two iterations of that have just been different ways of telling people not to panic, slow down, relax. One of the downsides, and there aren't many, the internet's been a blessing for our, our hobby, but one of the downsides is up to the minute standings. We do not need those really ever, but especially at this time of year, they can really only, foster mistakes oh my team needs this my team needs that your team unless you had a a a need coming out of the draft there are no needs that have new needs that have emerged unless you're talking about injury or playing time those are the only two actionable items right now if somebody got hurt you lost one of the big pitchers or somebody has now lost their playing time Uh, did you lose estuary ruiz for some garbage reasons by the way getting sent down yes you need steals now because you probably put a lot of eggs in that basket sure but you do not need pitching because bailey over got wrecked in one start things like that and it is really hard but we go through it every year you know we're both lucky enough to be in this business for our, for our, our profession and we have to tell people every april breathe relax yes. no you're not going to cut your sixth rounder absolutely not slow down so you know some guys you got to take a second look in and say hey maybe there is something i got to keep an eye on aaron nola the things look really ugly right now and unfortunately with all this rash of injuries it's hard not to push toward that with him is something wrong with him physically but like luis castillo george kirby a couple teammates out in seattle my my percent concern right now is literally zero I have zero concerns about them. So it's difficult, but you got to be patient. Show restraint. Let your players try to do something here. It is still April 11th. That's nothing. All right. So you, you teased it there, and I agree with you. But And I, I'm old enough to remember, and I'm actually using an old enough to remember this time and not just being facetious, but CC <laughs> Sabathia struggling every April with the Yankees and then dominating in June. Yep. Um, it does happen there. But. We got to talk about these pitchers anyhow, and I think there's at least one pitcher that I am kind of uh, struggling with a little bit here, but it's not the first one. It's George Kirby is the first guy we're going to talk about today. Uh, Not a great start to the season. Had another bad outing this week against the Blue Jays. Yikes. Uh, It's let's uh, let's talk about him, though. He he is down a few ticks from last year in terms of his came on his walk. Mm -hmm. Uh, Control is still good, though, with George Kirby. And that's where you hit it for me right there. And that's the first thing that I kind of look at. And I'm somebody, I don't like the uh, the decimals. Uh, I try to encourage people not to even use the decimals on podcasts because it just adds another number to clutter small-brained idiots like myself. So I just, it was 3% last year as far as I'm concerned. It was technically 2.5% walk rate. But 2.5 to 3%, that's 3% to 3% for me. Mm-hmm. His walk rate is fine, and that's the bread and butter for George Kirby. If if he was losing that, if we were looking at like a 7 8% walk rate, which on its face isn't even bad, that's about league average or a little bit better, but for him it would be more than a doubling of his rate, then I would say, okay, his biggest you know foundational piece to his arsenal is is busted up a little bit but it's not it's completely fine the swing strike rate is barely down a percentage point again if we're rounding it's from 11 to 10 percent 380 babbitt fueling a 12.6 hits per nine that's it and that's all to me 
Like he's getting hit up more. Now, some of that's on him. I've always stressed on people not to use BABIP as a luck meter and automatically say that they're unlucky if it's high or they're um, super lucky if it's low. You do contribute to that. You know, we first started with Voros McCracken way back in the day with his dips, defensive right. independent pitching. And we, we've evolved since then to where they do have some control over it, some pitchers. But for the most part, it seems like he's just being babbit to death a bit, George Kirby is, and not really stranding runners anywhere near the clip that he is normally. 46% is a hilariously low left on base rate. It will venture back toward his low 70s mark. Everything will be fine. I would buy low on him if I could. If anybody's giving me a measure of a discount, I would take it. Not only that, I would buy it full market rate, to be honest. Uh, only concern for me is K percentage is 19.4%. It was 22.7% last year. Yep. Uh, swing strike is 9.3. I think it was it was 11. So it's almost 2% for me. At least that's what I'm reading, but I, I might be wrong about that. We count. Okay. So um, if you're not looking at fan graphs, I think we count like foul tips or something. So there is okay. a discrepancy sometimes okay. there. So two point dip is a bit different there. If you're not doing the foul tip counting, I totally understand that. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, max exit velocity is actually a little lower, but then again, it's max. It's all season long. So, yes. you know, that's, that doesn't really count after three starts, but um, you know, I, I want to see more K's. I want to see more swing and miss. That's the thing I'm concerned about. You know, a lot, you know, one thing about a pitcher who never walks anybody, he's always in the zone, which means exactly. you're going to give up more contact. Listen, I always used to talk about, you know, make the, make the uh, poker analogies. And I know you're a poker player, so you get this every once in a while. You have to bluff every it's, once in a while. You have to yeah. get caught bluffing. Yes. Um, and the same thing is true with the strike zone. Every once in a while, you have to be outside the strike zone. You have to make them try to chase. Uh, and they know if they know you're always going to be in them, then they can swing a little bit more freely. So maybe he needs to miss a little bit more. I agree with that. And I do think that there is a tipping point where maybe you are in the zone a little bit too much. And George Kirby could be the guy that needs to kind of adjust it uh, a little bit. I think it works the same way on hitters sometimes where they're too passive. They take too many walks. They go up there thinking walk first and they're letting these great pitches go early in the count just so that they can have at least an eight pitch plate appearance and maybe get that walk. And, you know, Jack Sawinski somebody that jumps out to me like that. Mm -hmm. Edward Julian, he hit two homers yesterday. Maybe he's getting off the schneid a little bit but i think he can be a little passive at times aaron hicks a guy that's been a great walker forever but at times i always thought maybe hey he was passing up pitches so there's a there's the same thing on hitting and pitching side there where you do too much of a thing there, there can't be such thing as it's too much of a good thing there i love that he doesn't walk guys george kirby but maybe you need to get out of the zone a bit more and i agree with you i do want to see the strikeouts go up because that was a big reason why i thought he could be a breakout guy this year is i thought he could start to get a bit more swing and miss because clearly he understands the zone he understands how to put the ball where he wants it start leaving the zone a bit more coax those whiffs and really jump up to another level. So I still love him. I'm still with him. But uh, yeah, there are some things there where I'm like, is it just going to be a repeat of last year, which is very good, as opposed to the strikeout jump that I thought he could have when the season started. All right. That was George Kirby. Let's talk about Kirby's teammate, Luis Castillo. By the way, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally stealing your that was player X thing that you do on Sleeper in the Bust all love the time. It. It's so I, I, good. Not even stealing. Utilize yeah. it as much as you can. As somebody who listens to pods too, like when I'm doing yard work, so useful. So let's talk Luis Castillo. It's not great, Bob, so mm -hmm. far with him. Not great at all. Uh, the thing that scares me a little bit about Castillo is just the whiff percentage is way down. That's that's the thing that it was 27.3. The K percentage, excuse me, was down it was down from 27.3 to 24%. Meanwhile, George Kirby would love to have a 24% K percentage, but uh, he also, Castillo also walks a lot more too, but uh, walks are actually down for Castillo this year. So his K minus walk percentage is something I've been trying to focus on in draft season. It's still pretty good. It's, all, it's not quite the, the that 20% that we're going for, but it's close. That's why it doesn't really bother me either. It's because if you round it, you're looking at 19% for Castillo versus the 20% last the last two years. The makeup is a little bit different. And one of the things with the strikeouts coming down is that there is a pretty precipitous swinging strike rate drop from 15 to 8. And again, it might be a little bit different if you're using a site that doesn't count foul tips like we do over at Fangraphs. But the bottom line is it's still a dip. And there's yep. no two ways around that. And that's something that you can look at and say, okay, wait, what's going on here? Now, another thing we know about Castillo and you're a Reds fan, so you followed him even more closely when he was Cincinnati, yeah. doesn't like cold weather, man after my own heart. 
no yeah. use for cold weather. <laughs> He's been in a few cold weather games. Maybe that's playing a role. I always am willing to give Castillo a little bit of leeway in in August, or excuse me, in April rather, um, and September when it starts to get chillier again on the back end, just because of that, because we know that that's not really his bag. Also a 451 Babbitt, which is sky high again. Uh, wow. You don't get off the hook for that. You play a role in that on, on some level, but it's not a ton of extra base hits and homers. I look at this and I'm still pretty comfortable with where I'm at with Luis Castillo. It's been a rough start. You hate to see it from an ace, but sometimes you just got to eat it. And I do think that this is the kind of run, and I know we say this a lot, but it's true. It's cliche because it's true that if it happened in the middle of the summer, we would notice it, right? You would notice when your ace goes fewer than six, three straight starts, giving up four earned with uh, 25 hits. But we wouldn't have anything actionable off of it. And so just because it's the beginning of a season doesn't mean it should be actionable now. Yeah, Luis Castillo, and it's four runs each each outing. Yeah. Um, it's not he doesn't have he doesn't have an over on us yet, uh, where it's just an <laughs> utter disaster outing. It's just merely bad. Uh it's really remarkable. Five innings, four runs, five innings, four runs, five innings, four runs, and you know, five mm -hmm. and two thirds in one of those. But Castillo, I I, I agree. I just would like to see more swing and miss, but I think that'll probably happen. The next pitcher we're going to talk about, I have real concerns about, maybe because I have them on my places. So therefore, it, it hits more. But before we do that, Vivid Seats. Finally, baseball is back. This MLB season, knock it out of the park with Vivid Seats and score great tickets to the biggest games of the year. Every fastball, every home run, every eye-popping play of your favorite team live and in person. Plus, with Vivid Seats Rewards, you earn rewards with every single purchase. Just buy 10 tickets, then cash in your credit towards your 11th free ticket. Talk about an easy win, and here's a pro reward tip. When buying tickets for your whole group, split the bill and make progress towards your free 11th ticket even faster. From behind the dugout to the upper deck, Vivid Seats has great tickets for all the 2024 games that matter to you. Just visit VividSeats.com or download the app today. Vivid Seats. Experience it live. See vividseats.com slash rewards for terms and conditions. Guys, I use I do I have used vivid seats. I think they're tremendous. I've gotten what I've bargained for every time. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's all you can ask for with an online ticket app. So I, I like them. Uh if you're in the business of buying tickets online, use them. Um let's talk. Agreed. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh a picture that I am worried about, Paul, and that is the Cleveland Guardians Tanner Bybee, who has faced Oakland, Minnesota and the White Sox so far. He has been terrible. I have Bybee in the main event. I have him almost. So do I. I have him. I have Tanner Bybee in virtually every NFBC format that I'm in. And I'm, I was like, oh, I limited the damage. No, I've got him like four leagues, including a B. Jeff Erickson. I think I've got him in yogurt. I've got uh, Bybee in scarf. Uh, it, it's it's tough. Uh, Bybee sits at 593, 183. Nick Pollock was writing about him yesterday, said he barely threw his change up at all. I do not and you like know, seeing that. I, I hate seeing that from Tanner Bobby. You know, what's particularly frustrating is that schedule that you highlighted. This yes. is supposed to be the softest of soft landings. Minnesota, the, the good team out of that trio is the one that he handled. He decimated them. Then the White Sox in Oakland are the starts you're giving up. That's just so painful when one of your top three starters is giving up two cake starts like that to a couple teams that just yeah. they're not good i'm sorry like it's just the face facts here they're those are two bottom five clubs and they've both gotten to them and it's really weird with tanner bybee and i know you always say i believe the phrase is uh you know all politics are local so when it is on your team it starts to sting yeah. a little bit more and so i i agree with that you know i waited on pitching in my second main event to where he's actually my ace and so I'm looking at this and I'm like, man, this really, really stinks. If I have a couple takeaways that that are at least keeping me afloat from freaking out too much, it is that the strikeouts, the whiffs are, are still there. Uh, swing strike rates essentially equal and the strikeout rates down a tick, which I'm not going to freak out about, about a single point. However, the walk rate spiking up from 8% to 12%. I don't love that. And a lot more hits and homers. So things are a mess right now. I really do think that, you know, yeah there's reason to be concerned the problem is and the, and the th you know thing i've been saying to people is like you can worry about him sure 
But to what end? What are you going to do about it? You're going to bench him? I don't think so. I don't really see a league format where I'm going to bench him. He's got a two-step coming up next week where he does have to go to Fenway, which I'm not super keen about, and then he gets Oakland again. I got to run him out there in every format, Tanner Bybee. And then if it if this goes under uh, if this is underwhelming, then we really got to assess and kind of figure out what's up with Tanner Bybee. Then maybe we do find start to find some sits. But until that point, I, I cannot find a sit in even like a shallow ten teamer for Tanner Bybee. This must be the main event league where you drafted first, right? Uh, yes. The, so because I, I I know that because I'm in the same boat as you. I I, I went. Hitter, 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 closer, hitter, yep. starter, starter. Yeah. Justin Steele, Tanner Bybee. Oh, Eek. no. Eek. Oh. I, I'm okay, though, is the funny thing. Well, that's uh, good. Tim and I are doing all right. I mean, it helps that we like stumbled upon a Tyler Anderson and, and, and started him this see week. It. No, we're not going to. We're just not going to watch the. the it's, I, I got Royce Lewis in that one, by the way, as far yeah. as like the the other early round hit. And yeah, I took a closer and five hitters among my first six picks and then went by B. Imanaga and then sat Imanaga because oh, of the no, Dodgers start, which Dodgers. I don't regret. Process over results. But oh, right. my God, was he so good in that two step? Yes. Imanaga is going to be fun for you this year, I think. I'm and excited. Until the jet stream kicks in in Wrigley, then then we'll talk because. Correct. I, I'm still waiting for a ground ball out of him, so uh, we'll, we'll see about that. But you know, still, you'll take it. You'll, you'll take that the flaws what we're getting when we see some other pitching right now. So if I'm trading, I'm not. I'm not going to buy low on Tanner Bybee though. If I'm in a trading, agreed. League. I'm going to not sell him either necessarily because for no one, no one really wants to uh, do, do that. But. Uh, yeah, not I don't selling know. low either. If I could, yeah. if I could sell it like fair market, if there was somebody who really believed and they were giving me something that was in line with his sixth round cost in a fifteen teamer, then I right. can be open to selling by B. Uh, because sometimes people do buy at market value; they just really want the guy and they see this as their opportunity. Sure, but I doubt that's going to happen because things do look uh, askew right now, and the fact that it's happened against two crummy teams adds to the concern. So, yeah, it's a holding pattern for Bybee. Big two-step next week. If he goes into Fenway and steps up, that's going to build a lot of confidence. And you do wonder, <laughs> I swear to God, though, if he goes to Boston and dominates and then gets beat up by Oakland, I'm like, well, is he playing to his competition or something? Like, yeah. he gets up for the big it's games and then... Points, yeah. yeah, like, what's going on? But, yeah, I want to see some things here. I'm going to be dialed in on both those starts and really kind of see where I'm at with Bybee, and then we can discuss sitting. I still won't cut him, even if this is a disastrous two-week. There's no universe where I'm cutting, but I might start to bench him at that point with Bybee. Yeah, I think so too. So that's Tanner Bybee. Uh, our next pitcher, uh, not great. Not great at all. He was really good in spring training. The pitcher we're talking about, Hunter Brown. Oh, I knew Worst it. Worst start of the season today against the Royals, the red hot Royals. The upstart I mean, Royals. Yeah, you bench your guys. You know, you definitely bench your starters against the Dodgers, the Braves, especially in Atlanta, and then Kansas mm -hmm. City, of course. <laughs> Who knew? Uh nine runs on 11 hits and a walk in two thirds of an inning against the Royals today. Um, we're at a point now where, okay, we're on official alert now ha have to be right. hundred percent gotta be. In fact, Justin and I actually talked about this on the sleeper and bus earlier today. So this will be out, you know, maybe both are out around the same time and you're going to hear us advocate that you could cut him in a 10 teamer. Now, I don't usually cut guys this early. He was on my breakouts list. I was buying back in on Hunter Brown mm -hmm. because I thought he showed some things last year, even though the breakout did not come. He had like a five-something ERA. There was a billion homers. The core skills were still there. I'm like, okay, I'm going to rebuy. Thankfully, um, I got scooped in both main events, so I don't have them anywhere, but you know, I was in. But he lines up to get Atlanta next, and then the Cubs after that. You're definitely out on the Atlanta start no matter. Yep. Outside of dominating them, you're not necessarily dying to face the Cubs. They're one of those teams that, like, I'm going to start my studs and kind of my second-tier guys against them. But beyond that, then it's kind of a case-by-case. Case. And right now, Brown is nowhere near the top two tiers. So you might not be using them for two weeks. If there's somebody out there in a 10-teamer and you really don't have anybody else better to cut, I can see it. I would be open to cutting Hunter Brown in a 10-team shallow league right now to pick up, you know, 
Tanner Houck or something like that. He's only like 55% rostered. So there's a chance that somebody like that is available in such a league. 15s and 12s and stuff like that, you got to still hold. Just park him on the bench for a little bit. It's bad, though. He looks horrendous. And another thing about KC, do you generally view Kaufman as a pitcher-friendly park? I generally do, yes. Yes, and I, I know you're realizing because I'm asking that I'm going to tell you the contrary, and that is true. I am going to tell you that it is not, and I, I was put on to this today uh, by you know just kind of passively saying, oh, you know, at, K at KC, you don't mind maybe facing them because of their park, and then a KC fan in my chat was like, well, are you sure about that? They are third in park factor over the last three seasons. That's 2022 amazing. through 2024 at 105 they suppress home runs which is what breeds that conventional wisdom but okay. everything else benefits 151 on th triples 110 on doubles 108 on on singles it's 87 on homers though so that's where we get the notion that it's uh, a pitcher friendly park but it's not it, and now you're talking about a good offense too so i'm not saying we run away from them with everybody but you might start picking and choosing a little bit more when you're going into Kaufman with your uh, middle uh, tier pitchers, middle and tier and lower, I should say. For sure. Now, the follow up too is interesting. I wonder what the Astros are going to do because if Bingo. they didn't have four pitchers on IL, uh, starting pitchers already on the IR, IL, excuse me, uh, got to get my various uh, league uh, thing. <laughs> your basketball there. mode. Yes. Uh, I think he would be out of the rotation at this point. I think to be a non-zero chance he misses that next start. Uh, but now because the pitcher, you know, because they're down Framber just this week, which I think happened after you and Justin did your pod on, on Sunday. Correct. Um, I, I, I almost, I'm pretty sure that you would be looking at, you know, sending him down or at least moving him to the bullpen at the very least to figure things out a little bit. But I completely agree with that. And, yeah. and that's, that's the thing. But Verlander's due back, and we were, you know, originally thinking, well, Ronald Blanco's in for a substitution, but Mr. No Hit McGee over here, you know, chasing down Johnny Vandermeer, isn't he earning himself some some oh, yeah. extra space? You know, JP France, a guy put up a bunch of great innings last year, had that 10 run massacre that didn't even totally soil his ERA. Like he still had a pretty good composite ERA despite that. Uh, Spencer Arrigetti did not have a great debut. He got beat up in KC. So mm -hmm. maybe that's the Fran that that's the Verlander spot. But like as they start to get guys back, Hunter Brown's got to be looking over his shoulder. So he he's gotta fix things. And maybe he needs to ring JV up. You know, that's his idol. He has similar mechanics to him, but certainly not similar results. So you're yeah. right. If they didn't have all these injuries, he would already be looking over his shoulder. The fact that they do is what could maybe salvage him, but um, it's bad right now with Hunter Brown, and I am nervous. Yeah, and they just don't have options down in AAA. They've exhausted nope. a lot of options, so I mean that's the really tricky part there about that. So yeah, very worried about Hunter Brown. Um, definitely, I'm, I'm cutting. I have an ale only league. It's four by four where I'm cutting him. It's my original league, uh, and I'm off to a terrible start in that league. Well, he's uh, not helping. No, that, that it was already bad. It was already in tough spot, a uh, tough sh shape even before today started. I, I hesitate to see how much it hurt me. Maybe if my pitching's bad enough that it didn't hurt me that much. Anyhow, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, just, but you know, if Braxton Garrett can dig out of the hole that he dug himself last True. year, you know, other pitchers can too. So we'll see. Uh, before we move on to our next pitcher, did you ever think that back to the golden days of fantasy football? You know, when it was all about the love of the game, the camaraderie, and yes, the bragging rights. Well, our friends at On Demand DFS are bringing those days back with their revolutionary app that's changing the game for fantasy fans everywhere. Gone are the days of confusing entry fees, playing against unknown masses, or juggling multiple apps to trash, to trash talk with your league mates. On Demand DFS is here to streamline your fantasy football experience, making it more about strategy, fun, and most importantly, the community. With On Demand DFS, you can create a contest in seconds, invite your friends, and you're off to the races. No entry fees, no gimmicks, just pure fancy football bliss. And here's the kicker. You're not limited to current season players. Imagine crafting your dream line lineup from over 5,000 NFL legends and today's stars using real historical data to simulate the action. And for those who hate the wait, you'll love turbo mode. Contests wrap up in minutes, not hours. It's keeping the excitement going all week long. Download the on-demand DFS app now and get started with a 30-day free trial. Dive into a fantasy football experience that's rich in history, strategy, and most importantly, fun. 
It's time to create your legacy with the ultimate lineup of legends and live out your fantasy football dreams like never before. That's On Demand DFS. We thank them for their sponsorship. Finally, we're on the Blue Wire Network. Here are their ads. All righty. Thank you for your patience and indulgence with that. Uh, we are here talking pan panic or don't panic pitchers right now. The next pitcher on our list was hurt last year, had a sore shoulder. Um, uh, and you know, down the stretch was terrible in spring training was terrible in his first outing, got a little bit better in a second outing, and then got some extremely bad inherited runner luck yesterday against the Cubs. We're talking about Joe Musgrove. Joe mm -hmm. Musgrove is a guy I kind of avoided Paul. Cause I was worried about the shoulder from last year. What say you on him? Yeah, I, I echoed you right there. I was nervous, and I got to be honest, I fell into a little bit of you know peer pressure, market pressure with my ranking on him, where mm -hmm. I, I kind of bought into the hype a little bit that maybe I was overreacting, but I was nervous on him. And I don't say that to like get off the hook. My ranking is my ranking, and I, I, I didn't go out and get him. I wasn't hard advocating for him. But as somebody that I've liked in the past, usually I'd be like, oh, give me all the Joe Musgrove that I can get. This has been a guy I've been following for years. This year, I just I couldn't get there. And again, I didn't even really like where I had him ranked. It was one of those things where I'm like, maybe I should move him down because you always talk about battle testing your rankings. I think it's yep. so important. It's part of why I do fall and winter drafts to really see where I'm at. And when a guy sticks at the top of your list for four, five, six, seven rounds after where you have him, your ranking's wrong. Simple as that. Yeah. And so, you know, I had him in the early 30s and I trickled him back up to 25, which isn't that big of a difference. But I had those fears about him and I just pushed come to shove, didn't want any Joe Musgrove. Then the spring didn't go well, like you said. Then Korea didn't go well. And we had our mains after that. And I just kept laying, laying off. And I just, I don't have warm and fuzzies about him right now. Again, I don't think it's particularly actionable. I, I can't see getting him out of the lineup at any point here. Let me see what he's got coming up. Uh, he is looking at a two-step next week at Milwaukee, home to Toronto. You got to use it. You just have to. If you drafted him, you got to stick with it. I, I really believe that. Yeah. You got to let your studs kind of play through. You believed in him enough to draft Joe Musgrove, then you got to ride it. But I can't say that I'm risk-free here. Um, the 418 BABIP will come down. The swing strike rate's at 14%, which is pretty good. But the walk rate is up. He just doesn't look like Joe Musgrove right now. The, the fly ball rate is really high relative to his uh, past. So I have concerns about Joe Musgrove. I, I share those sentiments with you. Yeah. Uh, I, I did not get any Musgrove at all. Uh, but so I did get Bybee. So, I mean, I've got that going for him. It's, it, it is like Bybee, though. If you have him, you're probably still using him, especially yeah. on a 15 teamer. I don't think we're down in Hunter, uh, in Hunter Brown territory. Agreed. Uh, more swing and miss than last year. He was 11.8 swing strike percentage last year. It's 12.9 this year. Uh, K percentage is down though to 19.8. It was 24.3 last year. That's a that's a sizable that's a drop. That's a dip. That's a pretty big drip. And, and it walks are up too from 5.3 to 8.1. So there's there's some some indicators there that are aren't, aren't mm -hmm. great, Bob. But uh, I don't know. Again, I, I I it's the shoulder for me is why I would. I'm definitely not buying low on him. I'm not trying to seek him out in a trade, uh, yeah. but I, I, you know, I, I'm probably, I might sell low. Yeah. It really depends on the returns. If someone's going to try to rob me blind, no, but if I can get something pretty strong and these are always hard to say like what, cause you're probably not doing a pitcher challenge trade. So you probably got to go out and try to get a hitter. And I, I, again, I, I don't even think I could come up with something off the dome of like what that would be, but I might at least entertain seeing what's going on with the Joe Musgrove market and maybe selling low if it's not too offensive. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, speaking of not too offensive, your 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 co-host said, "Oh man, I thought Jeff would bring on a good guest." Mitchell says, uh, "I swear I used to watch the guy in the right play MLB." The Mitchell show. is correct. You did used to watch me play MLB the show a lot. I still play a little bit, but it's mostly offline. And then as for Justin, I mean, I can't help with that guy. I have to put up with that guy three times a week, and now he's following me over here. Jeez. I know, I know, unbelievable. Welcome, Justin. Yes. Uh, he, it's, you know, it's, that's the th thing though, is like, I, you know, we missed you in tout this year cause it's fun hanging out with each other. Even like, that's the thing we all, it, our community is so weird that we all like each other so much, despite the fact that we're competing like crazy with each other. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. No, I, that was the thing I missed the most was hanging out. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't do any travel this year. I just sat, you know, stayed home, did the work because I'd have been holed up in the hotel anyway. So I was like, I might as well just stay home. But I miss just hanging out because we, we stay up all night, just playing poker, doing whatever and just chatting yep. and playing our favorite game ever, which is just name old players. Like we, we just I, I can't get enough of that. So I honestly I miss that more than anything else as far as, um, you know, uh, not coming out to tout or vegas yeah i love the name old fantasy analyst discussion we had that that was time. that was epic the best yeah and now ron John chandler's Vance. got a whole book on it so it kind of yeah like, i know now he's now course. he's giving out the code yeah yeah, yeah. bob stall ah! <laughs> yeah. that was great uh let's talk about our next pitcher uh had a rough spring in terms of babip in terms of hits allowed uh, was still striking guys out, and that's Logan Webb. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently sits at 486, 156. Had a, uh, you know, two runs on 10 hits over seven innings on Sunday against the, the uh, Padres. You know, looking so far at the season, this kind of is similar to his spring. 13 to 4K to walk, only one homer, but 22 hits in 16 and two-thirds innings. He gave up a ton of hits in spring training, too. Is there anything to this at all? Terrible defense on the right side of the infield. Yes. Um, I mean, at least the left side is strong with Ahmed and Chapman. But no, I, I, I don't really think that there's anything going on here that, again, would be actionable with, with Logan Webb. You know, the hard hit rate is down. If you're looking at the stack, has hard hit rate from 46 to 39%. Uh, the barrel rate's even down a couple ticks. Exit velo, all that sort of stuff. So it's not like he's just getting beat around the yard. It really does feel like the Babbitt's just running against him. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to come all the way down to his career 309, which is, in itself isn't even a great rate. But part of that is living in the zone and being a ground ball pitcher. You're just going to have higher Babbitt. Um, but at least with that left side of the infield, you can feel confident in Chapman, uh, yeah. Ahmed, but Estrada and whoever's at first, first baseman can only make so much of a difference anyway, but with Estrada at second, he's not very good. That part is a little bit nerve wracking, but what are you really going to do again? I just can't find anything, but set it and forget it with Logan Webb and yeah. we can reassess, you know, 10 starts into the season, but he's not somebody that's anywhere near coming out of the lineup goes to Tampa Bay this weekend, hosts Arizona next week, two decent challenges. And if he comes out shining in both of those, then you feel excellent about where he's at. So no, I'm not really concerned. It is a little bit of a bummer that your ACE is not acing, but there's just not much you can do. Yeah, one of those starts was against the Dodgers, and you know yep. I think especially at LA, I just don't like that. The again five percent drop in K percentage. That's the thing that scares me a little yes. bit. Yes, um, that I don't like that at all. But the fastball velocity is remained constant. I know velocity is not everything, but it's something. It's a big uh, deal, though. Yeah, uh, I, I I think I'm okay with the web, but that's a he he is my ace and scarf. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm, I, he's not acing right now. Like well, and the real tough part about the strikeout rate going down is like, that's not always been his big thing. Mm -hmm. And so when you're giving up some strikeouts for Logan Webb, you're like, well, dang, we were already kind of accepting that you're right. going to make it up in volume, right? Cause he still had 194 strikeouts last year. So his rate isn't great, but he makes it up with volume. But now if you're talking about 17, 18% rate, if that holds, well, then even the 200 plus innings is not really going to bridge that gap. So, you. No. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to keep tabs on that for sure. But for now, you just got to set it and forget it with Webb. Uncle Ted asks about uh, Logan Webb's teammate, Jordan Hicks, buying or selling him right now. I'd probably be trying to sell. I'm still skeptical on this. I obviously no one believes he's going to have a one ERA and an 83 whip. Sure. But it has been successful and it is interesting. This is one of those situations where I desperately root for the guy. I'm very much in there, but I don't bring that fandom to fantasy because i just don't i don't really see how it's going to work over the full season he's had so many injury issues um you know he doesn't miss bats despite how nasty some of his stuff is it's because they're 100 mile an hour sinkers which is not really a bat missing pitch i know it's down to 97 as a starter i'm not even worried about that below dip that's fine going from relief to starting uh, it's just that he doesn't miss bats. And so I love the newfound walk rate so far, down to 5% mm -hmm. from the double digits that he's always lived at. But I just can't I, I just can't do it. Um, I saw somebody in chat say they traded him for Buxton. I can get behind that. Yeah, I, I like can that. too. You know, I'm not a Buxton guy. Toby knows I'm not a Buxton guy. <laughs> uh, canonically, I let him go to, to Toby. And then he That's got, right. 
Um, can't believe you let him do that. Uh, and it was not the, not, not criticizing Toby for doing it, just saying that, uh, uh, I, I'm just not that guy, uh, on Buxton there, but uh, then last year I owned Buxton, of course, in the main end, I got what I deserve, but, uh, so, so it goes, but it's easy to get redrawn back in on him though. You know, mm -hmm. you think I'm going to quit Royce Lewis after this year? No, I'm a no. moron. Of course I'm not. <laughs> this is the year this is the year let yeah, me tell you this is the Dude, i'm that way with trout although i kind of backed off trout this year i finally I actually of course he's going off i went the other way i dove deep Did i got you? trout in both mains good uh, he was a must get for me and now i've not won on that yet it's off to a fast start but anytime you get mike trout in the fifth round for me that just felt like yes i understand the risk but it's all injury it's not talent so that's why i was totally in on him but yeah with hicks again i root for him it's fun to see so far uh but if you can sell high and i do think getting somebody like buxton who himself is not off to a great start but i do think that that's kind of selling high because buxton still costs more at the draft table than than jordan hicks did mm -hmm. I, I i'd still i'd still rather go with something like that i'm just just not sure how this is going to work for hicks for a full season and we're going to get Buxton and outfield eligibility if we don't already have it. Um, Correct. He's at 10 so. games. So he's at unless 10 he's dh some. Well, yeah. 10 games total. I don't know if they've all been at outfield. Okay. All right. So, yeah. And since I'm not in the Buxton market, I haven't been tracking that this year. So we'll see. Three oh. DH. So you need three more for the okay. 10 game I'm not qualifications. So bad. Not so bad. Uh, the one one for one trade I saw on Yahoo, which you can do, which one thing I love having a league on Yahoo for is seeing the trades that were made. Uh, the one one for one I saw involving Jordan Hicks was for his teammate, Jung Hu Lee, as an oh, example. I like oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would do something like that. And I'm not even necessarily against the other side there. You, you got to go in eyes wide open, though. If Jordan Hicks gets you 85 innings, you got to kind of say, well, I knew what I was doing when I got in there. But that's mm -hmm. why I don't worry about rest of season. I'm trying to abolish rest of season questions in the fantasy community, Jeff. Who cares? Because unless you're talking about aces and stud hitters, you're not, there's no need to think that far in advance. For So for Jordan Hicks, don't ask me a rest of season question. Ask me a two to three week question, because that's the kind of increments that we have to take with somebody like that. Sure. Now, if you want to talk about like Trout for Marcus Simeon rest of season, okay, because we do expect them. Well, we don't know if Trout's going to, but the idea I'm is- I'm getting Simeon that deal, I'm, I'm snap calling. And well, then, me too. I couldn't. I'm calling I, the other table, as a matter of fact. I could only think of two players off the top of my head. That would not be a very good trade. I would take Semyon uh, all day, and I love Trout. But if you're talking about upper echelon players, you can talk rest of season. But once you start getting past guys that go in the first in single digit rounds, stop worrying about rest of season. Two to four week blocks, depending on the caliber of player, and then go from there because nothing is guaranteed. We've seen that throughout already this For year sure. with all the injuries absolutely true on that one there okay so that was uh logan webb and then jordan hicks well jordan uh, hicks uh offshoot there yes sidebar if you will uh yes let's talk a little bit about another guy that was hurt at the end of the year last year and max freed uh is similar to me for as musgrove i i think i got freed in one league uh out of 14 and it was not really my first choice uh but he's been smacked around a couple of times and mm -hmm. i'm worried here paul because the forearm issue last year and the fact that he wasn't hundred percent for the playoffs um, clearly wasn't himself. I, 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 and starting this year, I know he had the Phillies and he had nasty weather and all that. And I know the Braves and as a whole have had some terrible weather issues, but I'm really worried. I, I am right there with you. This is two bad outings. Now coming off a big injured season does exacerbate it. The walk rate being through the roof and the swinging strike rate being in the tank, those two things in concert, like a lot of factors. And it's been five innings across these two starts. I get it. And again, sorry to keep reiterating the same thing. It isn't particularly actionable because no, I'm not sitting free. Even if I do have him, I didn't get him anywhere, mm -hmm. but I do still think you have to stick with it at Miami this weekend. And then at Houston next week, they're not as scary as, as they normally are. I think you got to keep rolling with him, but there is reason to, to be concerned. And I think you got to keep close tabs on him. The way you're doing with Musgrove, you're keeping him in the lineup, but you're diligently looking through the game logs to see, are we seeing improvements here? Because we will get to a point six seven eight starts in where then maybe you can start to decide to sit a guy um and here's just hoping that he's not hurt because we lost so much of max freed last year i really hope that it, he's just working through some things and he's going to hit the ground here and and really go crazy but um you, you 
you can't not be a little, I know it's a double negative, but you got to be a little bit nervous right now through right. these two ugly starts with Max Fried. Absolutely. Uh, he's just not throwing strikes period. I you know, yeah. want to look at the, the massive drop in the swinging strike percentage. It went from 12 to 6.4. Yeah. And Oof. you don't want to know why it's because he's walking 12 and a half percent of the batters he faces right now. He's just why not swing? throwing strikes period. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, I mean, I just, the velocity is the same at least, but that's about the only good uh, indicator there so far. Uh, watch these these carefully. Again, you have them in a is your ace or your second starter. You're kind of stuck with them, uh, but man, oh man, um, yeah. At least it, for now. Yeah. I, again, there's like a there's there's no set number, but I'm usually in like the the five to eight start range before I'm going to sit anybody of that caliber. I might trade low, buy low on Freed. I don't know. Might buy I mean, low on him? I think if there is, if someone is selling him low, I, I might go and swoop in and buy. It's hideous right now. I think you could get a pretty substantial discount. Right. That, and that's my point. You're buying not just low, you're buying lowest. Yes. Yeah. Again, and there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, I, I think so. Here's one. Now, this might not sound like buy low because yeah. this guy's like the hottest thing going right now. But Justin and I talked about maybe selling high on Jackson Holiday on the hype. Because, like, what are we really expecting from him? The, the, the yeah. line I came on was Masataka Yoshida, which he was a good player. He's a solid player. But I think the hype on him, on Jackson Holiday, is to be quite a bit more than Yoshida, who last year put up uh, 15 homers, eight steals with a 289 average. To me, that sounds about right for Holiday. I think you might run more and hit for less power. That's what I think will happen. That, I, I, that's I can see that too because I, I just don't think the power is going to be there yet. That's why I really want to tap the brakes on Holiday hype, and we don't know if the batting average will be there. That's his strength as the hit tool, but mm -hmm. he's kind of learning on the job a bit. So I don't know. Like the highest hype you can get versus a guy that's on a low, low, low right now. I don't know if that's the right answer. Maybe you can get him even cheaper. But I wonder if Holiday for Freed would be something that would be interesting in a redraft. Not selling uh holiday in any sort of uh keeper league yeah now, I, you know we had holiday's uh debut on our outline anyhow so um uh, furtively segue. assembled outline at that but uh you know it's uh you know what it's, it's good enough to talk about there i think you're right um there is by the way i think there is a main event league where he is not rostered uh i thought oh I saw, wow uh, yeah um, that's gonna be pricey yes it will be uh it had I, to be I, like I, the Thursday morning. No, I lied. I lied. Oh, okay. He's hundred percent rostered. I don't know why I, he popped up. Maybe it's just because he's on reserve. My a, a, a scraping tool I use uh, showed him up there, but that's not true at all. Oh, okay. He is hundred percent rostered, but as he should be. Right. Of course. of course. But I think your point is solid about holiday because I think he's one of those guys that is a better real life player than Bingo. Possibly, than fantasy player right now. Uh, because I just don't know if the po the power or the the stolen bases are necessarily going to be there. And, and that's that, exactly that's, where I'm at. Yeah. So. And th that's why I think you you could look to sell on the big hype right now. Okay, he's up. You don't have to stash him. What can I get? And then you're going in asking for somebody who isn't even pitching well right now, but does have ace caliber potential in Max Freed. I don't know. You know, depends on what players have and what what's out there, but that might not be a, a buy low sell high that uh, that I'm against there. I think I could get get behind something like that. Yeah. By the way, it's April 11th and we're telling people to be patient on a lot of players. I it used to be we tell people in May 15th to be patient. Yes. You no, know, it, it, it's just the sense of urgency is stronger than ever and because I get it. And, I do too. Uh but it's still it's, wrong to overreact. Like yeah. I understand the inclination, but you should already have like two to four roster spots that you can churn that aren't your studs so you really shouldn't be having to touch the top two-thirds of your of your uh of your lineup right now not mm -hmm. just your lineup um of hitters but like your entire team i should say right and so you should have those back end reserve guys that you can churn so there shouldn't be so much urgency to like move on but we all want to manage right we want to get in there and right. do some things to shake up the standings and really your best course of action right now is usually to sit on your hands now be active in the free agent market but cut your bad guys don't cut your guys that you had real expectations from not bad guys but bad guys yeah. exactly uh, like i'd cut somebody like oswaldo cabrera who i love actually and i bought i'm like i, I bought him on the hype i'd mm -hmm. cut him before i'd cut any of these guys that we've been talking about 
right? And he's still yeah. doing well. I'm not even dogging him in any way. I'm just saying like, because that's a guy I, I randomly picked up. You just cannot get rid of these top tier guys that you right. drafted your opinion should not have changed in two weeks that much it's not even two weeks of games for most of these guys it's nine or ten yeah that's right that's right absolutely right about that ellie or holiday ellie by miles and i'm not even a big ellie guy this year because of his price not because of his talent but it's ellie by miles because of those steals he's going to give you are so much more fantasy relevant I, I thought i saw on fantasy pros they do their like what they've been worth sort of thing you know, mm -hmm. we, you know, we do earned auction value is what we do on Rotowire. But I saw, I, I saw that Ellie was like the number three fantasy player, uh, because of all those steals that he's had. Yeah, and, he, and, and they're just so consistent. Now. Yeah, and I might take a take a bath on him. I couldn't pay second round though, and I was advocating against it completely. I stand here. by that. Um, get at me in September, right? If, if it's wrong, I'll take the L. And I even said in my bus list, I said, this is one I want to be wrong on because that means he's having an electric season, but it's still a 35% K rate and 6% walk in the midst of this three homers and six steals. It's yep. because he has a 458 BABIP and he runs like the wind. So yep. he's a God. I love him, but I couldn't pay second round for Ellie. Right. And I paid third round in the one of my beach Jeff Erickson drafts. And that was the only share I got of him of 14 team, league. Also different. 12 too. teams. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's an important distinction is my third player. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yay me. Uh, I got Austin Riley before that, which is a completely opposite type of player, too. So, uh, unfortunately, and who was your first rounder? <clears throat> Strider, but uh, that's all right. Oh, okay. Well, that would have been an amazing trio if Strider was. It still were. Right? It was for yeah. for days. It was great. I, I re yeah, I really enjoy that that trio. Um, even taking somebody like Galley, like I said, the twelve to fifteen teamer is a huge difference for me. Mm -hmm. And then your third player instead of your second, it's the opportunity cost of the second round. And in a fifteen team league where the waiver is is you know sh uh, shallower, that is why I was nervous about him. Exactly. So. I'm looking at the earned auction value tool on the site. And mm -hmm. uh, right now, Tyler Glass now is the most valuable pitcher so far. He's had four starts. He's had three wins. He's thrown more innings than everybody else. Who is the number two earned auction value pitcher? You are not going to get this. Paul Blackburn? No. Um, <sighs> not enough Ks. He has like Rennell. seven Ks. Blanc uh, no, Blanco would have been too obvious because he said, I'm not going to get it. No, you're not going to get it. I don't Spencer think Spencer Turnbull. No. Um, okay, I'll stop yep. guessing. You're hovering around there, but uh, I'm in. I'm in like the vicinity. Uh, you're in. You know, American League pitcher. Uh, okay, I'll give you that. Uh, got a win last night. That's your hint. Got a win last night. Is Wasn't it Cody even going to be. It is Cody Bradford. You got Love it. Cody Bradford had to get that win this week, man. Three so wins. okay, we got to talk about him. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about him. Do you think he's going to get kicked out? How can he? He can't, right? It has to be Heaney. It has to be. It okay. has to be. Because that, that's what I was concerned with, and I was talking him up like, okay, he's somebody to go get this week, get that start against Oakland, but don't cut him until they say he's out, especially if he does well against Oakland, and then it turns out he did do well. Until you hear them say that he is out of the rotation, you hang on to Cody Bradford. And I've even been advocating that in a 15-teamer, he could still be good even if he did get kicked out because he's, he could get two multi-inning outings per week and maybe right. snake a, a W there. So I'm I'm big on Cody Bradford. I really believe in a lot of this. I know he's a bit of a soft tosser. He throws 90, which these days, you know, people act like uh, you got three arms or something because it's just, it's so, it's so light. <laughs> That'd with be all an these advantage guys. in today's arm injury market. Yeah, you, yes. you would think just go to your third arm there. But, uh, you know, throws 90, but he's a control artist. Uh, he misses enough bats. There is going to be homer risk, right? Because he's been yeah. running hot with that. Cody Bradford has a 3% homer to fly ball rate, uh, which is fueling a 0.5 homer nine. But if you don't walk, guys, I mean, this is kind of a Bailey Ober Jr. type of kit where mm -hmm. the Ks are solid, the walks are immaculate, and the home run issue is going to be the problem, and that's what's going to blow him up on t at times. I don't start him against the super, super tough teams, but other than that, I'm in on Bradford right now, and I think he's a pickup still if he is for some reason still available after the Oakland start. Yeah. Michael Lorenzo, why don't you go ahead and make another rehab start? Yeah, why don't uh, you just stay down there a little bit longer? Yeah. Um, yeah, and Max Scherzer, take your time too. But no, um, you know, certainly no one wants Or Heaney to the pen. He's done it before. Yep. He, you know, he can be a swing man. Um, 
But I think I think it's hard to take Bradford out right now and then, you know, tell your guys with a straight face that it's a meritocracy that you're running. Right. Right. Um, so we'll see how that happens. But man, he's 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 just so good. It's kind of like Turnbull in Philly, though, too. How can Taiwan yes. Walker displace you know, uh, Spencer Turnbull? Let's talk a little Spencer Turnbull. We don't really know a whole lot about Spencer Turnbull because he's been hurt so much lately, but he mm-hmm. looks like a different pitcher right now. He really does. Spencer Turnbull was somebody I did take a shot on late in my main and actually had him benched for that first start against your Reds. Uh, you know, just nervous about the Reds in general. And I, I don't regret that, you know, process over results. But hey, a lot of times when you bench somebody and they pop off, you should actually be happy. As frustrating as it is to see on your bench, that means you've got good bench talent, right? Yes. Like my bench had a killer day yesterday and it did kill me. Edward Julian, who I sat for the first half uh-huh. because he faced the Dodgers uh-huh. and one lefty and two righties. And the two righties were Bobby Miller and Tyler Glass now. Um, Colton Kowser, who I've been sitting just because his playing time is sporadic and Jeff Hoffman got a save. That was my bench yesterday. Oh, just the Jeff Hoffman save off. on your bench. is just, that's mean. it's killer. Especially Although at because least you added him. I mean, Jeff Hoffman. Well, I drafted him. A, oh, you, even better. You I've, I've been in on this as him, him as the closer and it's nothing against Alvarado. It's more the way they're going to end up using matchups. I think the lefty is going to get pulled into the earlier innings more often. You know, when Freddie Freeman comes up in the seventh with two on. You're going to Alvarado. Mm-hmm. So that's going to leave the ninth open for Hoffman. I really believe in him. So, yeah, that was painful. But back to Turnbull. So far, so excellent. S- strikeouts are up 32%. Walk rate, 2% right now. Swing strike rate, it does not match a 32% K rate. It's at 11%. That's fine. That's like about average. But it, I don't think the Ks are going to be legit. But I do think he's going to be at least as as good as like the best iteration of Taiwan Walker, right? And that's who he's competing against. And so if he's running hot, if he's the hot version of what that tier can be, then I think he should keep the job. So I'm interested in, in Spencer Turnbull. Like I said, I drafted him, started him this week for the two-step. The interesting part is that the difficult part of the two-step is is this weekend against Pittsburgh. They're, yeah. they're like the, uh, the Royals of the NL, the upstart team that you want to be careful with. But I'm excited to see what Turnbull can do. And then he gets the White Sox next week as long as he stays in rotation. I don't know when Taiwan's due back, but right now we're in on Turnbull. I think I think we got to keep starting him pretty consistently with these matchups looking favorable. Yeah. If if And again, take your time on that rehab there, Taiwan. Uh, you get paid the same way regardless there. So just, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Checks will keep cashing. Yeah. Meanwhile, like the Astros, like, please, could we have Taiwan Walker? We really like, love <laughs> oh my God, that, Taiwan yeah, Walker. What right wouldn't now. they give to yeah. have somebody like that uh, coming up soon? I mean, they got Verlander coming back, but even then they need another one because he w- that was only going to be one spot. With losing Fromber, that's kind of just in getting them back to the that level. Exactly. Exactly right. Um, so, yeah, it's just, Astros are 4-10 and 10 right now. It's rough. They've gotten slammed the last two days too. Uh, if if, they, if it weren't for Ronel Blanco, where would they be right now? That's crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, another struggling pitcher before we get you out of here. Here, Jesus Lazardo, off to a kind of a rough start so far, uh, along with the rest of the Marlins. Uh, it, oh my gosh! Yes. I, I, of all these pitchers that we've mentioned so far, I think I'm the least worried about Lazardo. I know he got hammered by the Yankees. But he's got 17 strikeouts in 15 innings. Mm-hmm. Uh, home runs have been a real problem for Jesus Lazardo, though. Four homers already allowed in 15 innings. A home, at least one homer in every start. And that's exactly it, right? I look at that for Jesus Lazardo, and that's going to be the bulk of the issue. And he's he's had uh, issues with home runs before, going back to 2021 when he had a 1.9 rate, which is sky high, but then dipped to 0.9 for the uh, for 2022, which was 100 innings, which, you know, almost the same size sample as 2021, which was 95 innings. And then 1.1 last year, we can live with that. Mm-hmm. He's not a 2.4 homer per nine guy. Things are just a little squirrely right now. He's still missing bats. He is walking too many guys at 14%, but I do think Lazardo is going to smooth it out. He wasn't somebody I was aggressively after in the draft. I was kind of letting the draft maybe give him to me at points if he kind of was still on the top of my list, but I wasn't attacking where he was on the draft board. But I don't see myself really sitting him. Now, if you are in a daily moves league, and so you could pick and choose... So you you had him in for New York because you're like, okay, New York is a good team, but we're not going to run from that. I would run from the Atlanta start. I don't want to start virtually anybody against them except like the top 10 guys. 
But yeah. if you took the two step, then obviously you have to eat the rest of it if it's a weekly moves league. But then next we get the Cubs. I respect the Cubs. I think they're a good team. But Jesus Lazardo does not come out against the Cubs for me. Agreed. I think, and, and I think sometimes we go a little overboard on the benching. I think it is the Dodgers, the the, the Braves, maybe the Yankees. We'll see how that's more. Not there yet, but maybe. Um, and then Coors Field. Yes, Coors and, and Cincy for me at Cincy. Yeah, I see. But the problem is you have to start somebody and then you can start getting it. That's why if you add Baltimore, you add Fenway. That's the thing. You, like, you get to the point like, well, who the hell? You, you don't have the luxury to do that. Right. Especially we talk a lot in the 15 team world, which we have to acknowledge that it is a bit different in the 10 and 12 team, which is why I try to always loop that in. But if you start putting too many restrictions, who the hell are you starting? So I agree. I keep it pretty tight on that premium list. Mm -hmm. Um but I agree. You can't just go benching everybody. I think right. Lazardo was a start this week because even though it was difficult with the Yankees and Atlanta, it's a two-step. Yes. And, you know, I might have picked this up from you or it was Todd. I think Todd Zola, when I talked to him on Rotowire, mentioned that he was somebody that might have been the one who coined it. But, like, if you can't start somebody on a two-step, you need to reassess if they belong on the roster. There needs yeah. to be a really good reason why you're doing that. Like, for example, this week, Aaron Ashby. It was his first two starts at Cincy at Baltimore. Okay, I can skip a two-step and still justify keeping him on the roster. But, like, if you couldn't start Bailey Ober this week, I know the first one was the Dodgers, but the second was at Detroit. If you're not starting somebody in a two-step, you really need to assess if they should be on the roster. So, back to Lazardo. I'm not too worried. I, I, I'm fine if you have to take the Atlanta start because you already started him and then get him, keep him in for the Cubs because even if he gets beat by Atlanta – I'm going to roll with him. I got to trust this guy. He was my top, what, four starter? Mm -hmm. Five yeah. at the most if you drafted a lot of early pitching. Right. You got to roll with him. You got to give him some starts to really see where Lazardo's at or else why did you trust him? Right. Exactly right. 26.2% uh, K percentage. That is down from last year. It was 28, but it's only nominally so. Uh, yeah. Swing strike rate is also down uh, too. Home runs are obviously up. I mean, it's the home run to fly ball is 25%. He's that's crazy. <laughs> every ball he gets in the up here, he, she gone. <laughs> uh, so that, 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 that is a problem there a little bit, but I agree. I think Luzardo also is going to get dealt uh, because yeah. the Marlins are the Marlins and they're going to be and they're part. terrible. Like you said earlier. Yes. Yes. That is one thing that I did. I'm not, well, I'm going to say it. I got it right. I said, to, I go under 78 and a half at the beginning of the season. They 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 had a negative run differential, but made the playoffs last year. Yep. They lost Kim Ang. Uh, they they not lost. They 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 she foolishly squandered let her go. Kim Ang. Yes. Yep. Um, and then they didn't add anything this off season. Nothing. And Nothing there were hitters lingering out there yes. for them to get a good price on. They let Soler go. Yeah. Like I don't know what they were doing, and obviously, you know, they have so much pitching depth, and it shows you how quickly it can evaporate. That's why you don't have to trade a pitcher every time. And I know I put them on a lot of fake trades of like they move a pitcher for a hitter. Okay, well you didn't do that, but then you got to sign somebody. Like I know he hasn't come back and done anything yet, but why didn't why isn't JD Martinez on that team? Like right. he. I think he's now local to the area. I don't know if he grew up there or anything like that, but I know that he has some ties to Miami. So that would have been a fit from that standpoint. Like right. you brought in Tim Anderson. That's it. Come on. Do you, are you guys really competitors? I think you got to do more than what they did. And I, I really think they botched it with Kim Ang. What was she doing that wasn't awesome? Like where was she missing that they felt they needed to get rid of her? I thought that was a real right. Pulled off the Jake error. Burger trade for crying out loud. Excellent deal, by the way. He, and he still has like his power plays everywhere. So even in Miami, I wasn't afraid to, to dive back in on the burger train. It was almost as if the Marlins said, well, hey, our additions were last year at the deadline when we added Burger and Josh Bell and they were good additions. Sure, but that barely got you in. And yep. you're in too difficult of a division yep. to just kind of say, well, that's all we're doing then. No, you got to, you got to uh, keep the foot on the pedal there. And they just haven't. Right. It's just, you just look at their lineup. I mean, Bell is a fine, okay. First baseman. Sure. He's not a star. Arias. We, we know his skills are, I think they tend to get overrated a little I bit. Totally agree. Uh, Jake Berger who, okay. Above average, not a star yet. Big power cool. guy. Tim Anderson significantly below average last year. Uh, Doesn't appear to be coming through. out of it, by the way. I want right. to be, it's very early and I'm, I'm rooting for him because he's a player I, I generally like, like when he's being chill, but does not look good so far. Jazz Chisholm could be a star, but he's always hurt. 
Mm -hmm. We'll see. Jesus Sanchez. We love the ideas. Jesus Sanchez more than the actual, like what he's done so far. Uh, Nick Gordon is an, a starting outfielder and Brian De La Cruz is your DH. Brian De La Cruz is nice as like a fourth outfielder, but yeah. that's the problem. They, they, they lost the and didn't replace him with anything. And that, that it took a mediocre lineup to a poor one. Yep. I, I totally agree with that. And like, they must've just figured Berger was going to carry that load, but don't forget y'all to make the playoffs. Y'all had to have Berger and Solaire. Yes. So why wouldn't you replace him? Yeah. I, th yeah. I thought they really botched it by not replacing um, Solaire there. That really bummed me out for their potential to do well. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Uh, Antoine Cruz says he, he got Kirby for show days. Now he's regretting it. I think this is exactly the type of trade you should be making. Exactly. Yeah. I think you I did got... well. I got no issues with Shota. I drafted him in a main, like I mentioned earlier, getting Kirby for him. I would do that a million times out of a million if I had the opportunity. Yes. So good trade. Well done. Um, okay. We did our problem, guys. Let's just finish with some fun stuff. You got a new okay. pod that you're doing with uh, Pitcher List, Nick Pollock. I mean, yeah, what a so great combo. Thank you. We used to do this on my uh, on my sleeper in the bus feed, the fireside chat. It was occasional. It wasn't really set in stone. Just kind of like when we decided, hey, we, we need somebody to talk about. This was born of our love for Luis Castillo, which after that kind of first 80 inning uh, run that he had, we were a bit aggressive with our rankings that following year. Mm -hmm. And then as he was kind of failing in front of our eyes uh the, those first couple weeks i called him one night and i just left a message who leaves voicemails who calls anybody first off and then leaves a voicemail to right. boot? gross i'm right. a hideous person but i was like hey man why don't we just get on a pod and like really deep dive this about what's going on what led our process to ranking him as a top 25 pitcher were we wrong are we morons mm -hmm. turns out by the way he salvaged that season a lot of people forget that that he ended up really turning it around in the second half there but anyway that's where the fireside was born in the subsequent six years we've done it on occasion and nick says well why don't we even just make a feed of it why don't we do it every week we're doing it now it's on pitcher list you can find the fireside chat in all your podcatchers and it comes out every tuesday or wednesday depending on when it gets posted we play some fun games we do like a streamer of the week a star of the week a sit of the week somebody who's rostered in over 50 percent of leagues at uh fantasy pros that we're sitting mm -hmm. and uh, we just dive into pitching sometimes it's one player focused the way the luis, C luis castillo one was other times it's a general topic this week of course we we kept it easy. We talked about all the injuries like everybody else did. But uh, yeah, I love talking pitching with Nick. We could do like three hours a week. We're not doing that to y'all. We're just doing <laughs> about an hour. But we could easily do three, four hours without even blinking. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm with you on that. And it's just very easy. I could I could talk to you for three hours. I could talk to Jen Stab for three hours, talk to Nick. So many awesome people. Easy to talk to here. Uh, Agreed. Let's finish off with the other. I don't know if fun is the right word, but. How about wild story? The Ipe uh, Shohei Otani affidavit here. Bananas. It is B A N A N A S bananas. It is so bananas, Paul. I still, I, I don't know what to fully make of this. Now I am fully in the bag for Shohei, so I uh -huh. really didn't want anything to happen to him. Right. But you just wonder if we're getting the full story or not. It just, I, it's yeah. so weird. And like, obviously I'm not going to, I can't prove anything. I don't know. It's just so bizarre. And it seemed like they were like the best of friends. And I know some crazy stuff happens and like right under your nose of somebody that's a loved one mm -hmm. or a really close friend. But man, some of this stinks, Jeff. Dude, it totally does. <laughs> it, it, it really wild. stinks. It's, it's so wild. I mean, I just... I don't know what to believe, but I mean, what bookie extends that sort of line of credit? I mean, I just, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't get did Chris. That. Did football's Chris Carter uh, highlight this ages ago when he had that viral clip of saying that you got to have a fall guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Always have a fall guy was, I believe his message. I don't I mean, doesn't that. that just seem like what this is? Yeah, it, it does. Um, I, I, I don't. Yeah. It's just, it's such a wild story. Like, he he basically admits on text that he was stealing though from Shohei. I don't yeah. know if that I mean it's like unless he's instructed to be that fall guy. This was in 2022, by the way. This text wasn't something yeah, so so that. could it have been that far planned out, right? Right. It doesn't seem likely. Yeah, the the the, the text in question that you're talking about, technically I did steal from him. It's all over for me. 
Yeah, and I think that's that was an old nuts. text. I don't think it was now, but that is nuts. So yeah, like I yeah. never really thought anything was going to happen to show. Hey, even if he did have some guilt, but it's looking like it's looking like this is all on on. I mean, he's certainly wearing it. Whether it is truthfully all on him, we do not know. But he's definitely wearing it, and uh, he's going he's going to prison. Almost one hundred eighty three million in bets. That's the crazy. Debt, like, losses of over forty million. That dude. is crazy, dude. No, and no, and no hits. Like, and, and, but no bets on baseball this whole time. I mean, yeah, where is that? So Pete, Pete Rose, Rose people, like, Damn shut it. up. Yeah, shut <laughs> up. Okay. First off, if you ever find yourself caping for Pete Rose, go look in the mirror and realize that you've taken a lot of missteps. That dude is a scumbag through and through. There, there so are you, other issues with Pete Rose. Not exactly. Not you never betting. need to be on his side, okay? For many reasons that go well beyond the betting. Mm -hmm. But this, even if you wanted to just paint it in the most favorable light for him, it's still not being a manager betting on your own team, which is the cardinal sin. So, you know. There might be some issue here that he maybe shouldn't have been betting all this money if it was Otani, but it, it's looking more like this guy stole from him. But how do you get that much stolen from you? I guess when you're so filthy rich and you're not controlling everything that you can just kind of get got like this. I, I wish I had that like kind of money. Ultimate trust and yeah. use and language difference. and Yep. <sighs> just a lot of factors that worked in Ipe's favor to really take advantage. And then he had to have leveraged Otani's name. I think we heard that early on, right? That he kind of leveraged Otani's name to maybe get the line of credit being more. Yeah. Do we think like Ipe was saying that he was betting on his behalf to that to that uh, bookie? Yeah. Um. I. I. I he might be. I mean, he. You know, Otani might be completely, utterly innocent, but then he's completely naive. Um, yeah. 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 There would be another issue at that point of like, hey, man. You maybe should pay attention to right. some of your fortune here. Right. I think there's a crypto angle involved here too. Uh, like, and that Isn't might be where, Yeah, there is. But I mean, especially, well, obviously if it's California, you can't bet legally here. Um, so yeah, that, that that's part of it. Um, and then how do you transfer the money? I mean, that, that it's via crypto and maybe investing in the wrong type of crypto. I don't know because, you know, even Bitcoin's gone up. So like, I don't know. At least that's what I heard. I'm not even that much into it. So I, I'm not super into it either, but I, I you know, you kind of hear things in the ether. I, I yeah. did hear that it went back up mm -hmm. after a, a downturn. So crypto bros in the chat, you can tell us where we're at on that. But yeah, it's just such a wild story. Um, yeah. It does seem as though nothing's going to come of it from, from Shohei's end. If, right. it, if it is as straightforward as they want to make it, where he was just completely ripped off and completely, uh, you know, burned by somebody he really trusted, then that's really sad and unfortunate. I know we're always looking for the other angle and nothing's as it seems and we got to put our tinfoil hats on. But if it is just this straightforward, let's just assume that for a moment. That's really sad, man. Yeah. That like you built this friendship and relationship with this person who seemed for all intents and purposes to be one of your best friends, kind of helping you navigate things here in the States. And he just ripped you as much as he possibly could have. And that's disgusting. And that's unfortunate. Absolutely. And you can say, you know, betting's a disease and all that, but that doesn't take out the personal responsibility of it. Agreed. And that, Agreed. that still makes you a scum, scummy person. Yeah. It's it's just awful. Just an awful it story. It really is. I don't think anything does come to Otani this year in terms of like, unless absent, like, like a, like, oh yeah, by the way, he was covering for me this whole time, which is never happening, but absent that. Exactly. It'd have to be something like that. Otherwise, he, he's just not going to get anything off of this. And that's fine by me, by the way. If he's not guilty, obviously, I don't want anything bad to happen to him. And I am defensive and like protective of baseball, too. And I also don't want it to happen from that standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't want that to be the only way we break into the mainstream. I say we as like a giant baseball entity. Right. I don't like that being the reason that ESPN finally gives more credence to baseball uh, or more attention, I should say. Um, but yeah, it, it is looking bad and uh, yeah. it does seem unfortunate for Otani. And, you know, I just hope that he finds people that he can actually trust. Cause that's horrifying that it like is. you're in this new country clear across the world. So much goes well for him. So much goes right. He's obviously got this money, um, which, you know, I know some people like when they've got a lot of money, well, don't feel sorry for me. You can sleep on a bed of money. Okay. That's not everything for everybody though. Like fortune is awesome, mm -hmm. but it's still difficult to be clear across the world, not speaking the language and trying to figure everything out when everyone wants a piece of you too. Right. Everyone wants a piece of you for their own gain.
Right. So that's anyway, right. I love Otani. I hope the best for him, and I hope that he is scot free in this, and it sucks that he got ripped. But thankfully, with that fortune, he really won't see any financial negatives from it. So that yeah. part is at least okay. Yeah, but it just makes you wonder, like, who can you trust? And that's the part. Exactly. That's and that's the part that sucks because then he puts up even a bigger wall and then just, you know, feels like you can't trust anybody. And I understand where that paranoia can develop for rich people because they do feel like everyone's just trying to get a bite at the apple. And that's disgusting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. All right. On that happy note, <laughs> things up here. Uh, the world sucks. Trust nobody. Yep. Thanks for you listening. Might- don't panic and don't be disgusted either. Don't trust anybody. All right. Yay. All right. No, but Paul, it's always a pleasure. Come, thanks for coming on today. Um, we do this every year and uh, it's super fun. And I know you do a lot. You were doing a podcast earlier today. So I appreciate you taking some time with me here. Of course, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me on. And I want to just wish you again the best of luck with everything. Jeff's mom passed recently, as they mentioned on the Sunday episode. Just want you to know that I love you. And if you need me, let me know any way I can help. Thanks, brother. Right back at you. Thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in. All the well wishes I've had. It's been overwhelming, and I've, I haven't gotten back to people. Promise me. I promise you I've read it, and I appreciate all those that have reached out. So thank you for that. Um, we have got uh, another great podcast tomorrow. We've got Clay and Todd. Real two-start starters. I was listening to them at the Denver airport last week. Good stuff there. So make sure to tune in that tomorrow. Take care, everybody. <laughs>